Welcome once again to Confirming the Church's Bible Class. It's a delight to have you with us today. We are studying from the book of Acts. If you'll turn to chapter 25, we'll begin our discussion there in just a little bit. We're here uh, each and every week at this time. We are discussing the Lord's will for the church today. The Bible was given to us by God, Ephesians, excuse me, I'm sorry, Jude uh, verse number three, uh, delivered from heaven to chosen uh, writers, prophets, and uh, apostles, uh, evangelists, and uh, protected by God down through the ages and translated into practically every language on earth today, available to everybody and um, applicable to every soul on earth, as it always has been. This is the message of our Creator to us, the created, how we are to live, uh, where we came from, and uh, where we're going, what comes next, what God's will is for us. He created us so that he could bless us, uh, but he has given us conditions by which we are to be blessed. And so we uh, study his word to learn what is his will for us today. And we have been doing that from the book of Acts in particular, because this is the book which describes what the apostles of Jesus did after he departed back to heaven again. You can read that in Acts chapter 1. We studied that in the beginning of this series of lessons. All of these lessons are archived on YouTube. They can be accessed through the website uh, indicated here on the poster, uh, acts1541.org. And uh, we encourage you not only to uh, look at each lesson and see what we can learn from the book of Acts, but also to encourage other people as well to turn to God's Word and understand why we're here and what is our responsibility in this world in which we live. Well, we have come to Acts chapter 25. As we discussed last time from chapter 24, Paul was in prison, in, uh, well, uh, he was uh, restrained uh, with uh, considerable liberties, but he was not uh, free to roam about the empire. He was confined to uh, house arrest, as it were, in um, Caesarea. And he had appeared before the governor, Felix, and uh, had been left there in, in a prison for two years. The governor um, looking for someone to bribe him to let Paul go because the governor knew that Paul was innocent of the charges and was innocent of anything worthy of of uh, any justice or, or judgment against him by the uh, nation of Rome. And so we find in chapter 25, Paul still in prison. We find that the Roman government had assigned a new governor for uh, Judea, uh, for the land in which uh, Paul was, where the Jews lived. And uh, Governor Festus came into the place and uh, some uh, advisors in Jerusalem, when he went to Jerusalem to see the Jews, he was told that, that uh, there was a prisoner in Caesarea waiting for him, and they wanted to, still wanted to, their way against Paul. They wanted him uh, done away with. When Festus returned to Caesarea, he called for Paul and heard what he had to say. And he asked Paul, says, well, do you want to uh, be judged by your countrymen who are uh, accusing you? And we pick up the uh, reading at that point because we find here in this uh, 25th chapter really only one point that talks to us about the Lord's will for the church today. And it does that, again, uh, as, many, as we've seen in many cases, uh, simply by giving us an example of, uh, of what Paul did. And so we find in uh, Acts chapter 25 in verses 10 and 11, Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as thou knowest, uh, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. I see three particular thoughts in here, I think, that deserve our, our attention. Number one, Paul said, if I've done anything wrong, then I'm not afraid to die. Uh, Christians ought to recognize that it's just not right to break the law. In Romans chapter 13, Paul is very specific. And in 1 uh, uh, Peter chapter 2, 
uh, Peter is also very specific. Christians obey the law, whatever the law is, whether it seems like a just law, an appropriate law, that's not ours to uh, to judge or to decide. If, uh, if the law says uh, thou shalt not, then thou shalt not. If the law says thou must, then thou must. <laughs> Uh, whatever whatever the law requires, uh, we are not to be uh, we're not to be judges of the law, but doers of the law. And then also notice that Paul says, if I've done anything wrong, I'm not afraid to die. You know, if we do wrong against the the law, if we if we break the law in some respect, then we certainly ought to recognize it's it's right and appropriate. We ought to be punished. We ought not to be complaining about that. Many many times we hear people who have chosen to go their own ways, regardless of what society thinks about it. And then when their hand is called, uh, when uh, their, their arrest is a fact, uh, then they complain, well, you're being unfair to me. And that's, uh, you know, that's just not the attitude we ought to have. I mean, there, there, there's, there's a law, there's right and wrong, and, and uh, the, the government has the right to establish the laws. And it's our responsibility to obey the laws. But then Paul said, I'm not afraid to die. There's uh, something in that attitude that we should learn. Too many times we hear, of course, the world, uh, we very often uh, find uh, afraid of death and because it's unknown. We just don't know. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen it personally. Uh, we haven't talked with anybody who has seen it and come back to tell about it. And so we just don't know. And so for, for that reason alone, if no other, uh, we have a fear of death. But then the Bible speaks to us oftentimes about death, and we do, we're not completely ignorant about what is beyond this life. In the book of Psalms, in the 116th Psalm, and verse number 15, the scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God says it's a good thing. Uh, not from the worldly standpoint, as, you know, he ought to be dead. It's good for him to be out of our way. That's not the point at all. Because when we leave this earth, when the spirit is separated from the body, then we go to be with God. And God said that's a precious thing for his saints. It's a good thing for the righteous to die, for the people who are saved by the blood of Christ. Paul himself said, as he wrote to the church in Philippi, in chapter 1, it's recorded in verse number 23, I'm in a straight betwixt two. I'm in a tight place here. I don't know which way to decide. To depart and be with the Lord, which is far better, and he goes on in verse 24 to say, or, or to stay here and, and to continue to support you and help you, because, and that, that's, that's better for you. It's uh, beneficial to you if I continue to teach you and ground you in the faith. But with regard to his death, Paul said, it's better for me as an individual to go to be with the Lord than to stay here in this w wicked world. So death isn't a thing to be feared. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, I believe it's in verses uh, 14 and 15, that Jesus came to deliver us who all of our lifetime were uh, but because of our fear of death, we're subject to bondage. But we're delivered from that. We're delivered from that bondage to bondage to Satan and to sin. How many people do crazy things, illegal things, immoral things, simply because they're afraid to die? And very often the things they're doing are going to result in their death. Uh, if not immediately, then certainly by uh, the justice of the, of the uh, country's uh, system, the government. Because we were fear, because we were uh, fearful of death, we were subject to bondage. We would follow Satan. We would follow uh, man's ideas. We'd be a slave to anybody because we we're afraid of death. But uh, we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Jesus has shown us that there is life beyond the grave. He went into the tomb. And he came out of the tomb. Now, there are some people who say, well, he wasn't really dead, and that's why he was walking around three days later. But God said he was dead. Many, many eyewitnesses, many, most of whom were not his followers, acknowledged that he was dead. 
the Roman executioner on the site certainly had experience in knowing when a, a criminal or an, a, a person subject to execution uh, was dead or whether he's dead or not. Uh, they certainly knew the difference and they put Jesus in the tomb as, uh, as a dead body. Jesus showed us that there is life beyond the grave and that is the hope of the Christian eternal life in heaven with God, resurrection to see our Creator and to be blessed by Him and to live with Him forever. And so Paul wasn't afraid to die. He knew it was better to be with Jesus than to be here in this world. Well, then why are we in this world? And that's what we've been studying in this book. And what the Bible is here to tell us from the beginning to the end, that we are here to learn who God is and what righteousness is, and to develop the faith that empowers us to live above the sins and temptations of this world, to be righteous servants of Almighty God, to learn how to live in the family of God as children of God, so that when our time here is ended, we can be blessed by God uh, with His eternal presence in that beautiful home which he has created. In the reading that we have just noticed, that is in um, Acts 25, verses 10 and 11, Paul said, I'm not afraid to die. I appeal to Caesar. Well, what Paul was doing there was seeking the freedom to continue his preaching. And when we find uh, ourselves by society or by an individual, uh, by government perhaps, uh, restrained from preaching the truth, we should do what we can to find legal means, and Paul was following legal means, to get back into that freedom to preach. You remember that Peter and John, as they stood before the council, uh, acute or, or strictly charged not to preach any more the name of Jesus. They said, whether it's right to listen to you, obey you, rather than to God, you judge. But as for us, we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. Christians are people who are followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus as the Son of God, John 20, verses 30 and 31. And people who go around telling that, Acts chapter 8, and verse number four, speaking the word of Jesus, seeking the salvation of every soul on earth, because we love souls created in the image of God. We love God. We want to see none of his children lost. And so we seek to preach that word to everyone who will listen to it. Go and preach the gospel to every creature, Jesus told the apostles. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. And then he told them to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. Christians are to be brought to the Lord and then taught to go out and bring other people to the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, I believe it's chapter 11 and about verse number 30, we can read uh, that the, uh, the wise will, will uh, convert people, bring people to the Lord. And so if we're wise, that's what we'll be doing. And so in chapter 25, we haven't found a, a great deal of uh, specific reference to how we go on living. We just have a record there of, of uh, the gover change of governorship and the advice from the, the Jews to the governor. But uh, here we do find these three points in these two verses that uh, are something that we should uh, spend some time thinking about and applying to our lives. And so we come to chapter number 26. In chapter 26, we find that uh, the Jewish king, uh, Herod, Herod Agrippa, has come to meet the new Roman governor. In the province of Galilee, the Jews were entitled to have given the freedom by the Romans to, to have their own leader, though he was still under the authority of Rome. He was a um, a Jew, or in this particular case, a sort of a half Jew, or perhaps less than that, but they had Jewish roots and connections, at least, in his genealogy. And he had some authority in Galilee 
to uh, keep the peace for the Roman government. Well, he came to meet the new Roman governor of, of Judea, and he said, I want to hear this Paul that you've been talking about. He had heard about Paul. He'd heard the gospel, heard about the gospel being preached. And so he, he wanted to, to hear what, was, uh, what, what Paul was saying. He wanted to see the man for himself. I want to pick up the reading in Acts 26 and in verse number 8. Acts 26, beginning in verse number 8. We'll read a few verses here down through the 19th verse. What Paul said to, the, uh, to King Agrippa. Why should it be thought a thing incredible to you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and, uh, from the chief priests, and when uh, they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Paul is telling about what we read of him in chapter 8 and chapter 9, here in the book of Acts. That's the life that he had lived as a Jew before he converted to Jesus Christ. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest at midday, O king, he's still speaking to King Agrippa, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun and shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles uh, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul had a very hostile attitude toward Christ. And for quite some time, we don't know how long. Was it weeks, months, years? We don't know. We're not told. But he had persecuted the church to death, finding as many Christians as he could and either... Uh, compelling them, forcing them to renounce Christ or bringing them to death. Notice that even he, even such a one who would do that, can repent and be converted to Christ. You will never sin so badly that God will not forgive you if you repent. Change your ways, change your thinking, change your behavior. Come to Christ, and God will forgive you. He won't make you an apostle like he did Paul. You won't be writing a new Bible. God won't give you that, but he will give you the hope of heaven equal to that of every other Christian and the apostle Paul. All the, all the prophets and the apostles of Jesus. God loves you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You can't sin badly enough to cause God to give you up forever. In uh, 1 John chapter 5, John talks about a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. But in chapter 1, he has explained what he's talking about. The sin that leads to death is the sin from which we will not repent. If we repent, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, regardless of how bad those sins are. And, you know, sin is something that we categorize. A big sin, a little sin, a, a very bad sin, a not-so-bad sin. Sin is, de is a deviation from the will of God, the law of God. It's all bad. It all leads us to eternal hell, separation from God forever. 
but we think in terms of good or bad or worse than others. It doesn't matter how bad you think your sin is. God will forgive you if you repent. And then let's talk just a little bit about what Paul said about what happened on that road to Damascus. Many people preach that Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. Salvation doesn't come by visions. Oh, Paul saw a vision. There's no doubt of that. But what was the purpose of that vision? Well, Jesus was the one who appeared to him. Why did he do that? What well, he told us in verse 16. He told Paul, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. What? To save you from your sins? No. To make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen and of those things in the which I will appear to you. In order for Paul to be able to convincingly tell the truth of Jesus, he had to be able to describe a personal encounter with Jesus. Paul was called to be a witness. He knew that Jesus was dead. He persecuted Christians for preaching that he was alive. And then Paul learned himself the truth that Jesus is alive. And he was able to do that because he saw that vision. That's why Jesus appeared to him. And then Jesus told him, we find also a record, this is the third time we've seen the, the record of Paul's conversion. That was in chapter 9 and in chapter 20, uh, 22. Uh, Paul said here, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Well, what did the vision tell him to do? There's no instruction in here. But in chapter 9 and verse 6, he was told to go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And so he went into the city. And when there he was told, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, chapter 22 and verse 16. And so Paul obeyed that instruction as well. That's when Paul was saved. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. There's God's plan for your salvation. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If you don't do that, you're lost in your sins, John 8 and 24. Repent from your sins. Turn away from the will and the practice of sin. And uh, God will save you, Romans, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Confess your faith in Jesus, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, and then be baptized into him. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And the only way to get into Christ where those blessings are is to be baptized into him, Romans 6 and Galatians 3. Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And then let's notice verse 22 for just a moment. Um, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none of the things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. And he goes on to explain what that is. But in this verse, we do not have authority to call ourselves witnesses. We are not witnesses. Christ appeared to Paul to make him a witness. We're not, we're not witnesses. We didn't see Jesus on that road or in Jerusalem or in Galilee or any place else, alive or uh, dead, before or after his crucifixion. We weren't the people who stood there on uh, Mount Calvary, or excuse me, the Mount of Olives, and watch him ascend into the clouds. But those people who did see him are his witnesses. They can tell what they saw, what they knew. Now, Paul wasn't apparently among those who saw him ascend into the heavens. But in um, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that uh, the Lord appeared to him to, uh, uh, th that he was, a, he was especially called uh, and designated a, a witness by Jesus Christ. And we can see that right here in this chapter. So we're not witnesses. We're simply disciples, saints, sanctified people, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, evangelists. Uh, people who tell the good news. Uh, we can tell what is written. We can tell, we can repeat the message that the witnesses told us. Just as we tell a story, you know, my sister said she saw this great thing out there in the road, this, this huge, you know, 
or accident or whatever. I can tell you about the time I saw the largest locomotive uh, still in operation today. But, you know, if you didn't see that, you're not a witness of it. I witnessed the train. My sister witnessed the accident. I can simply repeat to you what the witness said. And that's what Christians are today. We simply repeat what the witnesses have uh, convincingly said and uh, provenly said. So in verses 24 and 25, we find that uh, as Paul spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. Much learning has made you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Well, the uninformed governor thought the gospel was just madness. You're telling me this child was born of a virgin and that he did miracles. He walked on the water. He healed the blind. He uh, healed the leper. And then he rose back into heaven. He was crucified and dead and buried in a sealed tomb, and he rose up again and walked around and preached again for 40 more days. And then he just ascended right up into the clouds. Paul, that's crazy. You, you studied so much, you, you lost your mind. You're mad, Paul. Paul said, no, not so. I'm telling you truth, and I'm telling you soberness, seriousness. It wasn't just something to get all excited about. It was something to think about very seriously. And we need to think seriously about that today, too. You know, I heard a story some years ago. Again, I wasn't the witness, but a sister in Christ told me, and I was living off in a, in a different country, as a matter of fact, when I came back to visit with her, in what we call the Bible Belt here in the United States, across southeastern portion of the country, in the state of Alabama. A sister was in a grocery store shopping, and uh, there was another young mother there struggling with a couple of children and trying to do her shopping. And, and this uh, sister in Christ said, let me help you with, with the children, uh, get your shopping done. And when they got all that done, they got to the checkout and the lady turned to, to you know, how can I thank you? That's just amazing. You know, well, I never saw anybody would do anything like this. And the sister said, well, that's what Christians do. And she says, what is a Christian? And so she told her, you know, Jesus of Nazareth preached and healed and showed the love of God to people. They uh, hated him for his righteousness and they crucified him, uh, nailed him to a cross and he died. They took him down, buried the body in a tomb. The third day he arose from the dead, showed himself alive by many infallible proofs to witnesses uh, 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 in great numbers and then ascended back to heaven. And the young mother stood there with her mouth open. She said, this really happened? <laughs> Yeah, this really happened. I mean, right here in what we call the Bible Belt, where the Bible is probably preached uh, more and more seriously than in many other parts of this country or many other parts of the world. And still, she didn't know. She'd not heard this story. She, she didn't know the details of it. But it's true. It's serious. It's to be taken seriously. God sent Jesus into this world to show us his love, John, Jesus said, it is recorded in the book of John, in verse 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he sent him here to give his life as a ransom for our sins. Jesus died so that we would not, ha not have to be separated from God forever. And we could be reunited with him from our sin if we'll repent from sin and turn to him. And we will be with him forever as long as we stay faithful to Jesus Christ by reading his book. And that's why we're here in this particular series of lessons, to read the book and to see what is God's will for us today. And I thank you so very much for joining us today. And I pray you'll join us again next time. Or look at our other lessons already archived here on YouTube. And uh, bring somebody with you to study these things and let us know how we can help you as you endeavor to walk. For Jesus Christ in this world. May God richly bless you.